everyone to the second uh, Rad Reads AMA on the day of the semifinals with the U.S. playing uh, England and uh, entering the uh, 4th of July long weekend. So this is going to be a quick presentation on one of my favorite topics, um, personal finance, investing, but really from uh, the lens of first principles. And so I'm going to go through this quick slide deck, and then we're just going to open, up, open it up for a conversation. And uh, I just want to thank all of you uh, for your support and everyone watching this video uh, for their support. So here we go. Let us, let us start with uh, superpowers of great investors like Ray Dalio uh, and Warren Buffett. And so you know, we can surmise that they're, you know, excellent at fundamental analysis. These guys have outperformed the market for a long time. They understand investor behaviors. They understand macroeconomics. They're billionaires. But what is really a superpower that all of us have at our disposal when it comes to investing? So there was uh, some research about some of the best investors across the entire Fidelity platform. And the best performing investors were, the joke was they were dead. Um, but what they actually made them the best performing investors is that they forgot they had an account. Uh, and so when they went back uh, and they found all these people who had these dormant accounts, they were the best performing accounts across all of Fidelity. Um, and I say that just because, um, you know, I, I, we have kind of all levels of investing on this uh, AMA, but investing uh, in, is so much simpler than most people make it out to be. And I'll give you just like a little bit of background on myself. I was a, a hedge fund investor, or technically uh, I was in a field called Fund of Hedge Funds. I look at all these complex strategies for years, computer algorithms, mortgage mortgage derivatives, options, leverage, everything. And in my personal account, I own one stock. And I've owned it since I was 16 years old. And it's the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index, VTSMX. It's a different ticker now, I think it's VTAX. Um, it's the top 5,000 US stocks. I buy it every month since I was 16 years old. I'm turning 40 in a week and it's been one of the biggest contributors to me being, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm totally financially independent, but I'm independent to the point that I am able to take a lot of career risk uh, thanks to literally buying one ticker <laughs> over the course of my life. That's how easy it is. Uh, I check my balances once a quarter. Um, I don't really like follow stock tickers or, or individual stocks, anything like that. Uh, and again, that's, this is one person's strategy, but I say that just to remind everyone that it's actually, it can be pretty simple. Um, I think a lot of market participants try to make things so much scarier because it makes you want to pay for advice. It makes you want to pay for more services. It makes you want to just pay for a lot of things. And by the way, the more things you do, the more stocks you buy and sell, the more someone else makes money. Um, you might make money too, but the more uh, action that happens, the more someone, the financial institutions are making money. So just start that with the, I put that out there with a little anecdote. Um, go on to the next si slide. So how to be a boss at investing. And my, uh, my personal approach is, uh, Oops, sorry, uh, is to set it and forget it and then just get out of my own way. I, I wish that sometimes that I could just actually forget my password so that I wouldn't even be able uh, to, check, uh, to check my account. And so much uh, uh, for me, investing is very much like eating broccoli. It's like, I know it's good for me. It's not the thing I want to spend my time doing. There are way better things, way better uses of my time. I've actually list them here. I'd rather do X than invest. Um, and so here are some of the, the things I'd rather do that, that invest. Maybe I'm leaving some chips on the table. Maybe I'm not. But for me, that investing is a means to an end. It's to live the life that I want to live. And it's not the end itself to, you know, to, um, to uh, you know, be involved in the market and to be tracking everything. So I, tr I really try to keep it uh, super simple. So 
um, Einstein said compound interest is the eighth, eighth wonder uh, of the world. And so again, uh, just going back, you know, again, I'll just use myself as a store, as a personal story. I started investing in 1996. Um, I've never sold a share of, of that one ticker that I've owned, that I own. Um, and, uh, I've never paid taxes on it. I've never paid, uh, I've never, um, paid transaction costs on it. And it's just been slow and steady wins, wins the race. Another thing to point out is I have, you know, I'm getting to be of the age where I've actually lived through two bear markets. And so when I started investing, it was, uh, you know, dot com was in 2001, uh, where stocks lost like 35, uh, I know they lost close to 50%, I believe. Um, I'd have to, let me get back to you guys on the number. I think it's 50% or maybe 40. Uh, and then in 2008, when I was in my thirties and I had a decent amount invested in the market and stocks lost close to 50%. Um, and so again, slow and steady wins wins this race doesn't need to be complicated but you gotta you have to take advantage of the compounding and the fact that markets go up over time and we can talk about that uh like why that is the case why you should believe that why we should continue to believe that that will be true or not um so i just wanted to get you guys thinking about three numbers um when you think about investing uh, the first is 7%, which is the long-term real return uh, for stocks over, I believe, 50 to 100 years. So if you hold for long enough, you will make 7%, and this is net of inflation. So it's, uh, it's real return. So if inflation is 2%, uh, that means nominal stocks are up 9%, but your purchasing power is 7% because you have to adjust for the loss of pur purchasing power from inflation. So if you hold stocks for a long time, you probably make 7% uh, over that time period per year. Um, the other number is that over seven years, and again, it depends how you slice and dice the, the, the data, but it's anywhere between five and eight years, stocks will, will always make money. Again, historically speaking, that doesn't mean, you know, the, the classic disclaimer, disclaimer uh, past performance is not a predictor of future performance. But if you look at long windows of time, and I'm going to share, share with you a tool where you can look at, you can see this data for yourself over seven ish periods, uh, um, stocks always are, are positive. And then I was just fucking around with the sevens. And so then there's the rule of 70, which basically says, um, if you take uh, your expected rate of return, so let's use 7%, uh, you divide, you take 70 and div divide by your rate of return. So 70 divided by seven, that means that every 10 years your money doubles. Uh, so it's just a quick kind of heuristic to see how fast, um, uh, your, your money, uh, doubles. So again, these are just little numbers that, that what I would love for you to take away from it is, you know, I, I presume that, um, you know, there are people in their thirties, maybe possibly in their twenties on this call. Like if you have time on your side, you can kind of put the money in and get out of the way. And there's a good chance that you're going to be in pretty good shape, um, you know, seven plus years later. Next slide. But people don't want to believe that. There is people will, people will always tell you that it's, it can't be that easy. Markets will crash. You should, you know, you should buy Apple. You should buy Google. You should buy Facebook. You should buy crypto. You should buy real estate. And, Sure. I think you should buy. So I think I'll address two things on this slide. One is markets will inevitably crash. Um, and, you know, the two bar bull markets I've lived through have uh, the markets collapsed like 30, 30 to 50 percent. And I personally generally have 50 to 60 percent invested in the stock market. So that means personally, I've lost 30 percent of my wealth uh, uh, in those crashes. Um, but if you ride it out and if you have, and something even better that we'll talk about is if you have the, the cojones to buy more when the world is freaking out, then you really can kind of separate uh, from the pack. But again, it takes some rules. It takes a lot of discipline and it takes getting out of your own way. Um, so the thing about markets crashing, uh, I remember I left Wall Street in 2015. 
15, four years ago. And people were so scared in 2015. Um, Europe was falling apart and um, Greece was happening. The energy uh, prices were falling and people like, and governments had a lot of debt. People were like, this is it. Like we're, we're doomed. So from 2015 to today, I think the market's up 200%. Um, Trump happened and people were like, we're, that's it. We're done. We're the mar Since Trump's been elected, I think the market's been up 80%. Again, people are, this is the thing about um, people predicting the crash for the markets. No one gets paid or gets noticed if they say things are okay. Just they're plugging along. Newspapers make money when they say things suck. Things are going to be bad. Uh, people who want attention get noticed when they say the world is coming to the end. The world is coming to an end. You're going to lose all this money. Um, and it takes uh, psychology to say, yes, the markets will crash. I believe that markets will crash. I believe that there will be another period where I'll lose 30, 40 percent of my money. Uh, but if I'm comfortable, if I'm confident that I won't sell or even buy more and that I have the liquidity to manage my myself, like I, I don't I don't need to sell stocks to pay my rent, then I'll, I'll be uh, in good shape. Um, as for picking individual stocks. Yeah, absolutely. You can make a ton of money picking individual stocks. But I'll tell you, Nicole's in the hedge fund industry. There are people who are paid millions and millions of dollars to pick individual stocks. And most of the time they struggle to beat the market. Um, and um, how, how did you have this epiphany like way back when considering everyone you were surrounded by professionally um, as a hedge to your hedge fund career? Like how did you develop well, this? So, so here's a, I don't know if you've seen this in your career, but that a lot of hedge fund people that I know, very wealthy, successful hedge fund people, just buy the S&P 500 because they, they know this. Like, they know that like, you don't want to pay taxes. Um, you don't want to pay transaction fees. And if you have time on your side, market, like, markets go up. And, and, and we should talk about that. How did I know it? I think that um, I'm a pretty aggressive investor. Uh, you know, I'm 50 to 70% invested in equities, even when my income is zero. Um, and I have rules for myself when the market's down 20%, I, I have like a earmarked amount. I'm like, I'm gonna buy like that, that day. Uh, and so for me though, it was, it was a few things. One, I had, you know, a few of you have been in my financial independence course. It's like, I love working. And so I'm confident in my ability to uh, make income. And so to me, investing is just gravy, right? Because I know that I can live my life off of my income based on my spending needs uh, and my income potential. And the market is just, you know, it's like I treat it like a bank account, really, where it's just like I put it in there and I know it's there um, and then I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to stress about it. It's just, it's just there. And I think one thing that it helped me, so this is another little advantage that I had. I'm very rules based. So it's like, there's a rule. It's like you put in a dollar, you wait seven years to even consider removing that dollar. Like I, I'm very disciplined in that regards. Um, but there are like little tricks. So for example, I, this is one, a classic, um, tr uh, strategy for investing, which is, um, uh, always max out your retirement accounts first, um, uh, because they have tax, they're tax advantaged. We can talk about that as well. Um, max out your retirement accounts. And so when you're investing for retirement, you can't touch the money for 30 years. So my view is like, if you can't touch the money for 30 years, I'm not even going to look at the balance. Like it, it's completely irrelevant to me. Even today, I mean, I'm like, you know, I guess I'm 19 years from retirement, like legal retirement. Uh, it's like so far away that it's just not even worth, I don't even care. I just don't care. Um, I mean, obviously like when the market's crashing, I'm like, Oh, that kind of, that kind of sucks. Uh, and so, but, but I, I, it doesn't impact my day to day behavior. Uh, I do believe that over, you know, five to seven year periods, markets will go up. So I'll be, I'm going to be fine. Um, 
The other thing, and this was like another little trick or hack that I used was um, I always try to take advantage of tax advantaged accounts. And we should talk about that as well. Uh, but when I was 22 years old by accident, uh, I started contributing to a 529 plan, which is a, a tax, to, tax advantage plan for, for going to, for higher education. So I thought I was gonna go to grad school and get my MBA. And so I was just putting in $5,000 to get a, there's a double tax deduction in New York state. And so I was just doing that. And you know, I had a nice income, so it wasn't like straining me in, in any real way. But I started doing that, then I realized I wasn't gonna go to grad school, but I kept doing it just for the, for the deduction, so 5,000 a year. And so from 22 to 20, and then my daughter was born when I was 33, so for 11 years I contributed 55,000 just to get the tax deduction and to max out. So I was just following a rule, get the tax deduction, max out your, your taxable accounts if you, if you have enough income to support your life. Um, and so I was following those rules, that like kind of like the rules that I set for myself. And when my daughter was born at 33, if you assumed a 6% uh, stock market return over 18 years and the 8% college inflation rate, I had saved enough money for her college. So that just shows you the power of compounding where you could save five grand a year for 11 years, but it's, 11, it's like negative 11 to like her age, uh, to her birth date. And so you, you have 19 years of compounding. Um, uh, for, I'm sorry, 18, 29 years of compounding. Uh, and just to, to put that in context, so the estimated cost of col private college for my daughter, four years, half a million dollars uh, in, eight, in, in 13 years from now, because uh, of like the, if the rate of inflation, higher education inflation continues. So just think about the compounding. So it's gonna cost $500,000 in 15 years now. I invested $55,000 that will pretty, I feel pretty confident will, will generate $500,000 of return of, uh, of growth uh, over a 29 year period. Um, and so that, and that's just like, there's no research or anything. It's just like, push a button, push a button, push a button, and just like, stop paying attention, basically. Um, you know, that is an extreme example like retirement because you have so much time on your side. Um, so you, you really have a lot of time. And, and I was just following the rule that I just wanted to get the tax deduction for the $5,000. Like that's why that was a six, that was worth 6% to me. So I was, I was making $300 in, in saved uh, cash in tax savings by making that, uh, that investment. So uh, those types of accounts where you can't choose what you're buying per se, your but your VTAX you can find or you just do like what, yeah. whatever's next. You know, back in the day, so when I o opened that account, I mean, it was, was a long time ago. It was, you know, it was eight, 15 years ago. Um, it was, uh, the options were crappy, but I always would go for the balance of the most aggressive which in like retirement plans, the most aggressive is usually like the S and P 500 or some version of it. Um, and uh, taking it into account the lowest cost. But today in, in most retirement accounts, you're going to get something like cut rate cheap to just get access to um, like they call for, for those of you not in finance, they call it beta, which is basically like buying the market um, at a pretty low cost. And so are you allocating like your tax advantaged accounts in the same way as just like your regular accounts? Yes. Um, my tax, so I always, I start first with, um, you, I'm sorry, am I allocating my taxable accounts like my tax advantaged accounts? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, pretty much. And, 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 and to be fair, maybe I was being a little bit dramatic. Like I have some private investments, but they're, they're, very small com relative to like the corpus uh, because I don't believe I have a competitive advantage in like making private investments <laughs> and I don't have the time to do it. I, I don't have the time to do it, but yes. Uh, and and it, it's, it's kind of, I mean, it, it, it gets scary because like it's a lot of dollars into literally one ticker. Um, but the, 
you know, to me, I don't have access to a lot of things, right? Like I don't have access. I mean, I have access to real estate, but I don't have the skill to buy real estate, nor do I have the interest. Um, I don't have the skill to buy individual stocks, nor do I have the interest. I could, um, I do manage, uh, you know, there's, there's the lower risk part of my portfolio, which is mostly in cash. So there's like a barbell between like, um, uh, basically the market and then cash. And I'll prob I'll play like a little bit with bonds, like, uh, like move, move longer duration to versus just like high yield savings. But right now high yield savings is pretty, uh, is a pretty good deal, uh, at like 2.3%, even though that's starting to, to go down. Um, but, but to answer your question, Brian, yeah, uh, it's pretty much with the exception of an oddball private investment that doesn't move the needle for me. Uh, it's pretty much, uh, the same strategy because I don't really have, I don't have many options, right? As like a simple public market investor who doesn't want to buy individual stocks, there's not, uh, there's not a ton of options, right? You can buy. And I think what I might hear in your question, right? There is, um, you know, you could, you might be saying to yourself, well, why don't you buy, um, you know, emerging markets or why don't you buy Japan or why don't you buy uh, frontier markets or why don't you buy small caps? And so, the, so one of the, the reasons that I keep it so simple is that, and for those, some of you might, this might be very obvious. Some of you might be unfamiliar with this, but there's a concept of correlation, right? If, if one, um, let's, what's like a good example? Uh, you could have um, Facebook and a stock and a refinery. Uh, so when Facebook goes up, the refinery probably goes up a little bit, but it doesn't really like move the same way. When the markets go down, Facebook loses a ton of money, uh, but the refinery might actually not lose money because it, it pays a quarterly dividend. So it looks actually more like a bond. It's just lower risk. It's a stable business. And so what happens when you put Facebook and a refinery together is you put something that zigs and zags together and it cancels out the noise, which is diversification. Um, and it can actually significantly reduce the risk that you have. And so, so if you go back to my situation, if you have a portfolio that's like all us stocks, well, the question would be, well, why don't you add international stocks to your portfolio? Like I could, and I've thought about it, but the correlation between international stocks and U.S. stocks is very, very high. Meaning if U.S. stocks fall 20 percent, European stocks probably fall, you know, 18 to 22 percent. So you're not really getting the zigzag benefit. Um, and it's a lot of extra work to buy and, you know, to, to figure out which other companies, uh, which other indices to buy, which, again, I go back to my principle. There's like a lot of other things I'd rather be doing than researching whether I should have 12% of my portfolio in Europe or 6% of percent of my portfolio in Europe, especially since they pretty much move identically anyway. So I'm willing, maybe I could, maybe the intellectually honest thing to do is to get a little, it would probably be a little bit better. But again, for me, K personally, it's not worth my time. If you used like a betterment or a wealth front, what they would do is they have all these models that will kind of find you the perfect combination of US and emerging markets and Europe and all that. Um, it's probably better than my approach, but you have to pay a fee for that. So net net, is it, is it better net of their fees? Again, it's hard to know. And I think the other thing to think, of, think about with these, uh, these decisions that you make, you have to measure them over like five to 10 years to know if you were right, right? So let's say you, Brian, you're like, okay, I think you're crazy. You've got to have 5% emerging, at least 5% emerging markets. We're like, okay, fair. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not worth, it's not worth it to me. I'm going to stay 100% US diversified equities. We won't know who's right for five to seven years. Well, yeah. And I mean, even then, like you can't necessarily say like, 
oh, this person's portfolio made more for the, so they're right. Like exactly. if you have more emerge, if you have more emerging markets, obviously it's like risky. So it's going to be more volatile and like maybe the whole market was on a larger upswing and it is more volatile. Totally. So, the the yeah, theory I mean, that would be, like you're, you're yeah. kind of managing that risk and volatility just through cash. And yeah. Through so the cash, market rather than like kind of making it more complex than that. Exactly. And, and to me, cash, cash slash sometimes I'm in like, short like short-term treasuries um but it's never like intermediate treasuries because i mean since 2008 which is like when i had kind of the most money to invest um interest rates have been so low that it just didn't ma make sense to buy bonds. that actually was the wrong decision like it actually made sense to buy bonds in 2008 and i i was just in cash instead but again that it's hard to know. Like it, it just felt right to me. And for me, again, it's like I manage, I manage more to liquidity that I need, anticipated costs, uh, and anticipated spend. Um, and, and I invest pretty aggressively. I probably like, as I'm getting older, you know, I used to be like, Oh, I'm investing for 30 years of like, yeah, when you're 20, you're investing for 30 years, you're 50. But when you're 30 or when you're 40 and you're investing for 30 years, you're 70, where you're actually not going to want to have 60% equities. Um, so I need to, to think about that a little bit, a little bit more. Um, but, but this goes, this is like a less related point. But again, I, I keep going back to uh, my career has allowed me to work on my own terms. And so I love my work, which, which allows me to love the way I make income, which makes me want to keep doing it. And so that's like, that's the buffer for me to keep me being aggressive um, in the market. Um, but at some point, I, I, and, and I've been thinking about this more, I think when you turn 40, you just, all the existential questions start to <laughs> kick into higher gear uh, that like, uh, are you really buying stocks for 30 years, Kay? Like, um, and, and at some point, and again, it has, it's unrelated to do with stocks, like why do you want to keep growing wealth, right? I mean, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a personal question. Like, do you want wealth to give money away? Do you want wealth to know that you had the most money possible? Do you want wealth to give it to your kids? Or do you actually want to have zero worry and just park it in cash? Like I, these are questions that, that probably I need to start thinking about in the interim intermediate future um, that were easier to punt when I was 20 and just say like, look, I'm, I'm investing for the long haul. I think I just have one more slide. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah. I love this concept of one big domino. Like what's the one thing you do? uh that will have a disproportionate impact on investing or on exercise you know so like for exercise it's like it's going to the gym right it's not like crossfit or soul cycle it's just like did you go to the gym and move around right that probably accounts for a large part of the health benefits of exercising it's just moving around um and not you know one rep maxing on your deadlifts uh, and so the, the big domino, and this is from Morgan, Morgan Housel's piece, uh, The Psychology of Money, but the biggest domino when it comes to long-term capital growth is your behavior. Uh, and are you consistent? Are you selling? I mean, if you look, this kills me when I see this, but if you look at um, uh, the outflows out of mutual funds, so like people redeeming, pulling money from mutual funds, and you track it with the historical, with the return of the market, investors always redeem at the worst time, always. It's like, it's so obvious, the data is so strong because you gotta remember when you're in the depths of 2008, like you're scared of losing your job, you're scared of like, like is the US gonna like lose its global hege uh, hegemony or like, you know, like, there are all these thoughts that, that are just so, and it's everywhere around you, but really the biggest uh, the biggest driver of financial returns uh, is are you behaving in the right way and the behaving in the right way is like are you invested and are you not selling at the worst time like that's that's really going to cover 80 percent and again we talked about the next level asset allocation adding five percent emerging markets that's not going to make the difference in fact 
um, there is, I'll share it with you guys after, but there was this, I saw it on Reddit, but there, I've seen different versions of this. It's like over the past 30 years, if you perfectly timed the bottom, like the, the trough of every uh, down cycle or perfectly time the, the peak or like, so basically you had the worst timing or you had the best timing and, or you just bought the same amount every month, buying the same amount every month is so close to having the best timing um, because like I said, you have time on your side, markets go tend to go up over time. Another thing that's uh, a little bit unheralded that people don't talk about, but the S&P 500 has a dividend yield of 1.5 to 2%, so which is taxed at, at 15%. Uh, and so you, uh, you're collecting cash, you're collecting dividends, you know, if you're making 7% a year, 2% of that return is actual cash that, that is not subject to market risk. Uh, and so, so uh, I, just think, I just think about, it, especially if, if you're not into investing and you're treating this more as you know, personal hygiene, financial hygiene, um, uh, getting uh, the, the right investor behavior is what's gonna trump every other uh, decision. Um, getting out of your own way, I just listed a few of the common investor biases, why people don't get out of their own way. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ones where, uh, confirmation bias is when you're thinking of making a decision, let's say you're thinking of buying Bitcoin. Um, you only see articles that show paint Bitcoin in a positive light. You don't read articles like that's actually a very human tendency, like the same way that, you know, Trump supporters hang out with Trump supporters and progressives hang out with progressives like you don't know the tribal uh, person in you doesn't want to uh, see the, the opposing view. And that shows up a lot in investing through confirmation bias. Uh, I won't go through each of these. I'll send you guys a, a story. But basically, they're all, you know, hindsight bias is when you you say, hey, I, I, I knew I would have done that if I had known this. Like you kind of you revise history to say that you will act differently the next time. Um, Self-attribution is uh, underestimating the, the role that luck played in your decision or overestimating the role skill played in your decision, right? Like you bought Facebook at the IPO and you made a lot of money. Like you believe you're a great tech investor. Um, that would be a uh, self-attribution bias. Um, so I'll share these with, uh, with you guys. Um, and then lastly, a few tools that, uh, that I use. Um, there is a tool called Portfolio Visualizer, which I think, um, you know, in the hypothetical conversation co competition that Brian and I had, uh, you could actually say 95% US stocks, 5% uh, uh, emerging markets versus 100% US stocks. And you could look at uh, like hypothetical, not hypothetical, real portfolios over all different time horizons to see how, um, how, they, uh, how they have performed, the drawdowns, how much money they, they lose in the worst time, things like that. It's a really powerful tool you can do. You know, some other asset classes that people like that, that, that would make sense to consider, like real estate investment trusts, REITs. You know, there, there's probably some value in having a REIT in, in a portfolio. And so you can look at, you know, will a REIT make your portfolio less risky, more risky over two years, five years, 30 years? Um, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful app. The conclusion that I often get with Portfolio Visualizer is I'm just blown away by how correlated everything uh, is to one another uh, when you're in the world of, of equities. Um, Budget, I mean, we talk more about investing than personal finance. Budgeting, I'm a huge believer in, um, I was late to the budgeting game and I was fortunate that I, I, for a long time I had, you know, relatively high paying jobs that I didn't have to think about it. But now that my cash flow is way more volatile, you know, the, the rad reads in me is, is that, you know, budgeting really forces you to, uh, uh, avoid escapism um and i think we all do some sort of escapism when it comes to spending um 
you know, we don't want to know how much we spend eating out. We don't want to know uh, how, you know, most of us, I would say, misjudge. We underestimate how much we spend um, if we don't if we don't look at it. So uh, I think a budgeting app, and there's two that I really recommend. Um, one that I use, which is uh, YNAB, You Need a Budget. Uh, the other that I know a lot of people like is Tiller, which is basically it hooks your bank account into a Google sheet. And then you can kind of, if you're like proficient at spreadsheets, it's really easy to tag and organize and kind of run your own reports. Um, and then another thing is like, uh, I, I try, I'm not too good at it, but I try to keep an investment log. And so when I make investment decisions, uh, I keep a lot of rules for myself. So like, like I said, when the market goes down 20%, I try to buy more, but what does that mean? Like, do I set the dollar amount in advance? Um, if it falls another 10%, do I, you know, so I try to like, like it's really important to, to be able to go back in time to see what you were thinking when you made a decision. Uh, it keeps you honest. And so I just try to, again, my investing is pretty automated. So it's not, uh, it's not rocket science to, it's like, yeah, I said I was going to do a thousand dollars a month for 12 months and I did a thousand dollars a month for 12 months. But it, you know, sometimes it's helpful to say like, why did you decide on a thousand versus 1500 versus, you know, 750. Um, so. Any automation tools for that? Cause you mentioned checking it quarterly, but you know, these, I mean, market swings happen uh, more frequently. How do you, how do you automate that that side of it? Yeah. So the 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 so the automation really is um, it's I mean it's dollar cost averaging. So it's just it's just that simple. Um, what I do is I um, I have a few rules that I kind of write out in a notebook in my my investment log, but I don't. It's not scientific like it's scientific in the sense that when i say i'll buy at 20 percent down like i will write the reference point of what 20 you know 20 percent from where right so so then i'm kind of like and i don't have that many of these uh you know i have 20 you know 20 uh and 30 percent across like one or two different accounts so it's it's and I'm, i read enough of the news to just kind of have a hunch that we're like getting close. Um, and again, it's not super scientific. Uh, the other thing I do, which is actually kind of a fun little thing, is that um, especially whenever I get like a random source of money, so like, I, so sometimes like I have some affiliate deals that I forgot that I had and like I'll get a check for like $112 or an investment that went to, you know, that like, you like washed out they're like oh there was an error like we work two years later we work there like, we forgot to send you your deposit back so they mailed me a thousand dollar check so every time i get a surprise amount of money i immediately invest it uh into the market because it's like it's like the whole like house money thing so like i have like more like little things like that for me personally it's been so long and i just trust this approach so much that it's kind of it's almost like a it's a game. I've seen it work. So it's, I'm almost like, yay, like more, like more, more, more time to play the game. That's like kind of fun. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not super scientific. I also just, um, created, I'm going to share it this weekend, uh, like a, a notion document that basically tracks like that. I basically input my, I don't, I, I don't want to use personal capital or mint, to aggregate all my financial accounts to see the daily movements because I just it it's so irrelevant to me that I just don't even want to know that it exists. Um, and so I manually uh, will go into it used to be a Google Sheet now it's Notion and I put in like the different amounts and I have different filters where it's like how how is my cash how is my you know like how much are my retirement accounts like things like that basically again because my income is a little bit volatile these days. I'm I'm much more concerned about managing my liquidity uh, than than uh, you know than like m more like portfolio allocation questions. That concludes the uh, prepared remarks. Um, 
if so i'll open the floor to questions on this but also questions on anything that you may have read from the you know countless spam emails that i send you you know multiple times a week so uh this is really your guys's uh your guys's time so i'm, I'm happy to riff uh to, to riff on any topic uh hey Kay, um you might have mentioned it when you're covering budgeting app but <clears throat> but if my, I'm in a similar situation where my income is pretty volatile, I'm, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur trying to throw a lot of stuff on a wall and see what sticks. Mm -hmm. kind of, uh, there's no consistency right now. And I'm curious, um, what's, what, can you go over like, I don't know, maybe like your daily, weekly, monthly flow of how you, how you budget and then how much, how much do you set aside again for your, for your um, index fund or any other investment? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for budgeting, it's been about six months now. I use um, UNAB, YNAB, You Need a Budget. Um, and YNAB is fucking nuts. But it basically every morning, uh, raise your hands if, or give me a thumbs up if you use it. Yeah. All right. So you, get, oh, so you use it. Okay. So you know. I, I uh, use it, but not, not, it's, I feel like I'm not using it to its fullest capabilities. Yeah, so my, my income is super volatile and I'm funding, I'm, I'm funding a lot of my own life from my savings because of that. And so, <clears throat> so I use YNAB, I, I categorize all the transactions. It's been super helpful to just know how much I spend, like with like a high degree of certainty. Uh, especially after six months, like, you know, you got a vacation in there, you know, you, like you, the smoothing feels a little bit more clear. Uh, uh, but in terms, so, so I have, um, I have a loose budget for myself and I say loose because I kind of think that I know, um, how much I'm going to earn. Like I have a, I have a sense of how much I'm going to earn. And again, it's not super consistent, but it's, it's, you know, within like 30%. And then whatever I don't cover, I fund from my savings. Uh, but I want to know, I, I treat it as a fixed amount. Like I want to know that I spend, you know, eight grand a month or whatever. Like my budget is eight grand a month, even though my income might be four grand that month and I'm going to take four out of savings. Like to me, it just helps to know, that I'm like, I'm like moving to that, this hypothetical eight grand uh, number. Uh, yeah. In terms of investing, my, my own situation is, uh, is a little bit unique in that um, I have a lot of cash. Like I have a lot of cash that, that like I was earmarking for entrepreneurship. So again, it's less scientific but now that my income, I feel more confident about my income, both like in that example, like I feel like it's closer to eight uh, and I could see it going to 10 or 12. So like if I see I'm like going to make, you know, if I see greater visibility, so let's say I, I see it going from eight to 10, then I'm going to start like putting that difference into the market more uh more aggressively so so to me and really like as a first-time entrepreneur i just didn't know how i was going to do as an entrepreneur which is why i kept so much cash um to give myself the ability to kind of stay in the game uh now that I, I feel more confident i probably should be more aggressive uh but i actually um yeah it's it's, it's as an entrepreneur it's still hard to, to be more aggressive but basically you know, it's kind of like, you know, so when someone gets a raise, uh, they'll take like 70% of their raise and invest it and, you know, spend 30%. I kind of do a version of that with like my much lumpier and more volatile uh, income. So did you give yourself like a certain amount of months or something like that when you kind of set aside that cash for the entrepreneurial I, stuff? I did. Um, so I gave myself like 18 months. And I moved and uh, I kind of estimated my spending and I moved, uh, I moved to kind of 18 months of living expenses into a different account and started kind of paying myself. This was like four years ago. So this was a long time ago. Uh, and I did that, but you know, life, life doesn't really work that way. Um, 
and, and for me, it, for the most part, it worked in my favor. But uh, of course, classic entrepreneur that year, my accountant made a mistake on my taxes. And so I owed like a, I owed money that was like, I worked on Wall Street, even though I had no income. And so, you know, that was kind of a bummer. Um, mm -hmm. But the market has been unidirectionally up since I left Wall Street. And so it was offset, but it's like, that's mark to market gains. So you don't, you can't eat mark to market gains, um, but it's still part of, you know, your corpus. So, and then I started making little dribs and drabs of income and it was much more splotchier. So it, it actually just became too hard to keep track of that 18 month number. Cause like I'd get like a speaking gig and I'd be like, Oh, I wasn't expecting that. And so it like bought me another month and then this tax thing happened and then it like lost me like two months. And then, but then the market went up and I was like, wait, I have the same amount of money as when I left that I was like, do I reset the 18 months? But it's marked, you know? And so it kind of got like too confusing. Uh, one thing that was clear is I had underestimated my spending by, by a long shot, which kind of pushed me to be more scientific about budgeting. I had kind of just like taken like a year's worth of credit card expenses and guessed my cash and divided it by 12, which is like, just, that was not the right way to do it. Um, so, uh, and so now, you know, now it's like a weird kind of confidence game because I'm much, much more confident as an entrepreneur. Um, I turn down money on things that I don't want to work on, even though they could be lucrative. Uh, so, you know, that's like kind of still feels weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so like, should I be more aggressive because I'm doing that? Like it, the, the answer is, I don't know like how to take, like, like if you're turning down money because you don't want to do the work, should you be more aggressive because you know you can make it or should be, you be less aggressive because you're turning it down? Yeah. I actually and, don't know the answer to that question. And so is that, is that a matter of your like kind of turning down more like one-off consulting sort of things in favor of like building mm -hmm. assets or like what, what's kind of no. the decision making there? No. That, that decision making is more, most of my income comes from um, coaching. coaching. Um, second is speaking and third is uh, consulting. Um, so I get offered consulting gigs that just don't seem compelling. They're just not aligned with like what I'm doing. Like the coaching is very aligned with what I'm doing. A lot of the consulting doesn't feel that aligned. Like someone was like, can you help me figure out like SEO? Um, and I mean, I, I can help you, but it's just not, Hey, I'm not that good at it. And that's just not, it's like, it's not a good use of my time. Uh, and so it's more things like that. There are also, um, I'm a little bit more discerning with clients and consulting engagements where I can get a feel by the way the person interacts with me over email that mm -hmm. they're going to be difficult to work with. Um, and so I kind of just like walk away. I, I've been walking away from, from those. And then, and then there are things that I could do, like there are specific courses that I could probably do just to make money. And I'm probably not as excited to do those, but I'm still, I'm, I haven't ruled those out. Hey. Any other questions? So it, it sounds like your, your spending philosophy also adapted. Uh -huh. It almost seems like an investment philosophy where you had to become comfortable spending more money, but you said, oh, I'm investing and spending time with family and working out. What sort of practical tips like did you sort of learn like as you had to sort of rejigger that philosophy to adapt um, oh man oh that's such a good question um you took the you took the workshop i think the biggest one is um abandoning the scarcity mindset which mm -hmm. is this kind of never-ending fear that you can lose everything right and, you know it comes from an immigrant mindset in my case it comes from an immigrant mindset uh, it comes from a lack of self-confidence. It comes from, you know, human wiring. 
And so, you know, I would never have spent money against mark to market gains, <laughs> but I just am more trusting, you know, not, I'm not going to spend all the money in my mark to market gains, but like to some extent, like when the market goes up, you know, a hundred percent, like you probably could feel good about spending 30% of those gains, right. Uh, without having to sell. So I think it's just, um, so, but if, but I think about practical tips, one thing for sure is being clear on your spending. Uh, that gives me confidence because there are things that I do that are ridiculous. Like, like a dude comes to our house and massages Lisa and I for like an hour and a half every month. Like I don't need that. Like I like to have it, but I don't need that. But knowing that there's like five t different expenses that are just like that, where I could snap my fingers and they're gone. And I don't, my life is not worse off because of them. Like, so just knowing that helps me feel confident that like, okay, I'm pushing this a little bit, but I could quickly pull back, right? It's like, it's, it's lifestyle. It, I think it's like keeps you against lifestyle creep while letting you enjoy like the fruits uh, of your labor. So like that was definitely uh, one thing. I think too, I mean, like n knowing, like loving my work made it, like I, I, I swear it, like I don't want to retire. Like I don't feel like this is work. So mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not making m m money doing this, but it's part of a bigger apparatus, a commercial apparatus. Like this doesn't feel like work to me. And so mm -hmm. if that's the case, like I'm willing to be more aggressive uh, to, to invest because like this is, you know, like, like I love, I love this, right? Um, another one uh, is really being honest about these conversations with your partner, in my case, my wife, because you're going to be the, if someone has issues with money, everyone has some kind of money issues you're always going to live your life to the lowest common denominator, not like lowest intellect, but the person who's more afraid that that person will always dominate. Their fears will always dominate the decisions. And unless you're able to talk through that, right? I mean, so many of our fights are fights about money, but they're surfacing up something deeper. And so being able to kind of cut and carve through all of that to really get to the heart of like, this isn't a fight about money. I mean, I, you know, you've seen, you guys have both seen me write about economy plus, uh, you know, like economy plus is such a, like, I don't want to do it, but that's like my immigrant mindset. That's like, you have to suffer, like, you, you know, lifestyle creeps going to take over. Uh, you're going to be broke. You're going to die, you know? And, and then, you know, my wife is like, come on, we can afford 59 bucks, like to be comfortable on a flight. And then I'm like, no, but you don't know how hard it is to earn 59 bucks. And like, right away, it's like, that's, that's not about money anymore. That is about respect. That is about appreciation. That is about, you know, anxiety, deeper anxieties about work or, or identity, what have you. And so, you know, I think, you know, we, her and I have gotten into a good place and this is not just money, but money is a big one, is like when we start going down that road, we kind of step back and ask each other, like, what are we actually annoyed about? Because it's not economy plus. It, mm. There's something else that's really kind of causing us to beef right now. And so I think that that, and oftentimes, it's, I mean, we just took an Uber from uh, Manhattan to New Jersey and it was like 200 bucks and it cost like it caused a, a, a brief fight but it was again it was like my panicking I'm like oh my god I'm spending so much I'm not earning much this month but I'm just like you know the difference is it worth $160 to not have to take two little kids like on, in a cab on a boat in another cab moving luggage three times like you know so we had that conversation and for me, you know, it was very much that fight or flight. Like I, on vacations, I, the fight or flight really kicks in because in the budgeting part of the equation, the vacations are like the big wild card. 
Like you don't, they're kind of like uncapped expenses to some extent. Uh, and there's a lot of, for us, a lot of escapism and denial or like, Oh, it makes sense to do this Uber here and do this. And then like, like in my head, I'm like slowly like ratcheting up, like, and I'm seeing it come through on YNAB. I'm like, Oh God, like this month's going to be killer. Um, but I think just having, being able to have that honest conversation, I send, I now do like a very brief, um, a monthly spending review where I just like screenshot the YNAB pie chart. Um, I do a cash because YNAB is not fully cash flow based. So I just do like all our credit cards were this, our cash was this, and these were our five biggest expenses for the month. Mm -hmm. um, and that again, it's less to, to, to like manage your finances, but it's more to have, to be on the same page. Mindset. Yeah. yeah. To be on the same page when we talk about it. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think it's like connecting to those like values, kind of like you said, and the priorities, like, I know like one thing that YNAB showed me was like me and my fiance were spending a lot of money on eating out. And I mean, I think that's like a common one for everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, and, but that is something we care about. Like we mm -hmm. care about going and having good food and like having that kind of one-on-one -on -one time. Totally. Um, and so for us, it like made us aware that like, okay, we can shift to like going out to like a super nice dinner instead of just like grabbing lunch two or three times throughout the week. Mm -hmm. um, so like we spend about the same amount of money, but like we get so much more out of it just totally. because we like had those conversations. Totally. Totally. And when you have kids, I think I don't fully appreciate it, but just you want to have like you don't want it to be stressful. <laughs> like, you know, it's stressful enough, uh, especially traveling with little kids on vacation. Like if you can pay a hundred bucks to not have to do two, tr you know, public transportation switches and luggage switches, like it's probably a good, it's probably a smart decision. But, um, but again, if it triggers deeper anxieties, then, then you're, you, you, you kind of like, you started fighting for off off balance. Well, hey Kay, if I were ever somehow traveling with you, I would definitely back you up on your <laughs> economy choices because. <laughs> but you know what? I'm telling you, with age, you know, my wife always jokes. She's like, I, she's like, I know you better than you know you know yourself, um, and you know, I, I I'm starting to come around with with you know, upgrading on flights and, and just suffering less, like paying money to suffer less, like oftentimes in the transit. And I think that there's a much deeper philosophical question there, which is um, like, what is your definition of happiness, right? Like, so think about a trip, right? Let's say, I mean, technically we could, you know, let's, let's say you could afford business class, but you don't do it. Like, does the trip start the second you leave your house to get on, like go to the airport or does it start like the day you land at the, uh, like at the destination? And like, would you trade, you know, let's say business class is a thousand bucks. Would you trade a thousand bucks of business class for a uh, future, you know, like one nice meal. And, and I think these are like at the heart of it, they're, they're delayed gratification questions, right? It's like, how much do you want to delay gratification? Um, and again, everyone has their own relationship with delayed gratification. I have gotten, as I've moved away from my scarcity mindset, I have cared less about delayed gratification because delayed gratification was my tool to fight the scare, was my old tool to fight the scarcity mindset. And my new tool is to be more, trusting of my situation and more aware of like the value like how, what do i value and in some cases i'm not there yet for the upgrade but i'm getting much closer uh, uh to, to 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 being there and at some point like i mean there's with delayed gratification there's a like there's an underlying mortality question right like you you can keep delaying uh but at some point you should start redeeming right like you should start cashing in and, and i think you know there's a lot of you know there's a lot of papers that say you know people like uh retirees they delay they delay they delay graduate gratification then they become retired they don't spend any money on themselves mm. they're scared it's like you work your whole life to like get to this point like start enjoying they're like no they're scared of the next shoe is gonna drop so 
I think that what I personally have come around with delayed gratification is that uh, I'm more aware that it can be a slippery slope that at some point, like maybe you do want to uh, start cashing in some of the, some of the delay. And then again, it becomes like aligned with your values. Like what, what are, what's important to you and are you willing to, are, are you, is that the right trade off? I wish there were a better way to quantify those values. Uh, so I loved in your real hourly wage, the, the line item, you know, how much time does it take to feel like yourself again at the end of the day? And so, yes, self-actualization is discretionary, but if you don't invest in it, then you're, you're asleep. So I don't know if, if you ever come across ways that we can better like quantify these values so you can actually look apples to apples and like make decisions based off of it. Uh, it would be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I'll send you this article. Um, there was a piece in the Times that it was about budgeting that was kind of basically it tried to uh, get you to kind of assign a feeling to to money to the money that you spend. So it was a little bit like the the hourly wage calculator in mm -hmm. in that regard. I think it was like makes me feel great, makes me feel neutral, or the, you know. Something, something like that. So, so there, there would be uh, a way, uh, a way to do that. But I think also, you know, this is a little bit of a cop out answer. But I think a lot of these things, um, by just cultivating your own self awareness and and kind of tackling your insecurities, mm -hmm. they they kind of reveal themselves to you mm -hmm. more so than you know. It's almost like the it's like the symptom versus the root cause so like yeah you could be like the symptom is like this is how i spend my time this is how i spend my money but the root cause would be like i'm so scared of this that it impacts like how you spend your time how you spend your money uh and so on and so forth so that that you know but i think that's like kind of my my answer for a lot of things i know you, you may have heard me um on the uh on the ted sides podcast capital allocators but I, I think one example that you that, that I've seen with my clients and, and with myself is like sometimes when I get in these modes of work when I'm like kind of a workaholic and they tend to be be fear-based and I kind of tend to close out close myself off from my family a bit during those bursts um, you know in my head the voice in my head is like well I'm doing this work because it's like the right thing for my family and and I think that's, you know, I've started to question that narrative because I would say everyone in my family would, would be happier if I worked less. Um, and, and that marginal extra amount of work I'm doing is, I mean, sure, it's going into the family coffers, but it's probably not moving the needle. And the motivation to do that work is probably, if I'm really honest with myself, it's actually not to do it for my, it's actually much more selfish. Like I want rad reads to be great or it might be for you guys or, um, and so, um, so I think that's where for me, self-awareness is like, I see the symptoms of it uh, and then I'm like, oh, I'm freaking out. And oftentimes it, it comes out of places of fear, fear and, and, uh, and scarcity. But I do think like, and, and it doesn't have to be as dramatic as, you know, life coaches and therapists and all that. I think often, you know, one thing like when I, when I get a little bit scared of something or something and I have a, a setback, I just like, I'll just like write it down, write a, write a paragraph to myself. And just when you take something out of your head that makes you feel uncomfortable and put it into words, it's actually very disarming uh, because you, you kind of look at it and you're like, wait, that's the, that's the thing that I was so scared of you know like when you see the words on a piece of paper so um and so it doesn't even have to be something super complex it could just be like a little mini uh mini reflection um that, that you have at a, a specific point in time any other questions uh, so I just wanted to come basically for that for me to summarize what was suggested today was that start early and stay in the investment is basically that's the take home for me is that right 
Yeah, that that's right. And I would, I, I'd say, you know, we can be a little bit more scientific about that. Start early, stay in the game. I think that um, always, well, not always, if you are confident in, in your income stream, maximize tax advantage savings first. Uh -huh. So, raw, you know, 401k is an obvious one, especially if your employer matches uh, Roth IRAs, um, 529 plans for kids, even like unborn kids, if you've got some extra scratch laying around. Um, so that would be, that would probably be, uh, the, the other starting point and to just keep it simple, you know, and it doesn't have to be my approach. You know, there's one fund in Vanguard that's, it's like 80% us, 20% Europe and Asia, 10% emerging markets. Like if you don't, feel comfortable with, um, with my, with, with, you know, buying one U S stock, which again, I don't know if that's the right decision. Um, there's something that's like a little bit more diverse. Um, a lot of these mutual fund providers have, um, they're called life, uh, target life funds. So if you're doing, you know, your retirement, like if you know you're going to retire in 30 years, you could just buy, uh, you know, target life fund 2049 and they will adjust it for you. So there's just a lot of ways, you know, I think betterment and, and wealth front, like I don't know much about the, the nuts and bolts, but they, 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 they do a good job, but it's like, again, it's just being in it, being in it, being in it in a way that's smart about taxes, staying in it. Um, and and just not getting whipsawed by the emotions like how however one can do that right which is like forgetting your passwords or not checking the balances or uh not reading the financial press whatever whatever kind of uh works for you, uh works for you but that that's like 80 you know that's like 99 percent um of the game thank you wonderful well, thank you. I've gotten a few thank you messages in the chat. Um, thank you, Avinash. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin, um, for participating on, on this uh, on this call. And like I said, I'm always here. I love getting your all of your feedback. We've got a Slack channel um, where we're talking about these things via chat, right? Pretty regularly. It's pretty awesome. Um, so I'll send a summary of this call with with that. And, um, and yeah, and also, uh, if you have any questions, just email me directly. You, obviously you guys have my email. I, I love this stuff. I really feel passionate that this is much more simple than it, you know, people make this more complicated than it needs to be. All right. Thank you. Have an amazing 4th of July, everyone. Thank you. You too. All right. Bye-bye.